Can we turn to organ transplants? Uh, there was a really interesting project that I think your your team was working on um, for a humanized pig transplants. Yes. Can, can you explain how this works um, and, and what were the problems that you needed to overcome? So, uh, so this is a, an old idea. It predates my lab's involvement, and and, uh, and we're very grateful to to people over 20 years ago. Uh, who, who worked on the problem and, and invited us to work on the problem 20 years later. Uh, you know, groups like uh, Novartis, uh, D David Sachs, and uh, uh, United Therapeutics, Martin Rothblatt, and the Tektor brothers. And those were the real pioneers. Uh, the, the problems overcome were there were multiple incompatibilities, with all of which had solutions. And like every researcher in this field, um, even uh, had their pet gene. So there were like three genes that were involved in putting different sugars on the surfaces of pig cells versus human. And those would cause very ag aggressive rejection, um, mm. you know, within minutes to hours. Um, so three sugars, then there was coagulation factors uh, involved in blood clotting, complement factors involved in kind of part of the immune system. And then, then the core immune system that causes graft rejection in general, which is the major histocompatibility, or MHC, uh, which causes rejection between you and me, it's gonna, and it certainly also uh, happens between animals and humans. So we had, and, and then finally, there was a, a different category, um, which was uh, almost, uh, as far as we know, every pig in the world, and every cell in every, in every, in every tissue of the pig uh, produces endogenous retroviruses. And so retroviruses, uh, many of, of them cause cancer or they cause immune deficiency uh, or their relatives cause immune deficiency. Um, and so these retroviruses uh, struck uh, the FDA as a clear and present danger to an immune suppressed patient, as is the case for organ recipients in general, have to have their immune system tamp down a little bit so that they don't reject uh, even even a very well matched organ. So we, so we set out to fix all of these things and, and by the time we collected everybody's wish list and put it into one list, it ended up being 42 genes, uh, 25 of which were viral uh, and, and the rest were all these immune and sugars. Uh, and then we did, then we, we knocked them off, we did all 42 of them. Um, the very first experiment was knocking out a strain that had 62 viruses. We did all 62 at once. That was kind of easy because it was just one guide RNA, one concept. But then we went into this more complex setting with 42. And now we call that pig version 3.0. And, uh, and there are, I've been told, 2,000 of them now uh, in the world. And, uh, and these are making it into clinical trials. Uh, these pigs exist both in China and in the United States, se separate strains, um, and uh, they look in, in the, they're in preclinical, non-human primate trials uh, where they look pretty promising. Um, we're looking at th three different organs. Um, ultimately, all the organs that you would normally get from a human, you could also get from these animals. Um, the same same genetic changes are good for all the organs, as far as we know. Um, and we're seeing sort of close to one year, over 300 day survival of these organs in, in the primates. So um, once we have kind of convincing, reproducible, scalable, um, one year survival, then we'll start the human clinical trials. Excellent. But, but you would still, in any case, you would still need a little bit of immunosuppressant um, but hopefully the way it is now, I mean, our, yeah. our ultimate goal would be to, I mean, these organs can be better than human organs in that, in that they can be more uh, immune compatible than human. They can be uh, more resistant to pathogens, viruses, more resistant to senescence and, and cancer than a, a normal human organ would be. So with human organs, you're really at the mercy of, you know, who died that week, and uh, and the fact that, that we're all human, um, but with with the pigs, you can engineer their germline, which is something you can't really do with a human organ donor, uh, so that they are 
enhanced in all these different ways. Right. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I, I was going to ask about that, but that sounds, yeah, really interesting. So th there was another kind of, I thought, similar experiment where you were creating T cells, um, like I guess uh, universal T cells that, that could be used to yeah. target uh, cancers in, in people, but that would not be rejected. Was that, can you talk about that? Is that using a uh, similar technology? Um, somewhat. I mean, they, they have in common that they're multiplex editing. So, uh, uh, most, you know, throughout history, most, uh, groups have been, uh, not only satisfied, but fairly proud of the fact that they could change one gene. Mm -hmm. introduce one gene in a transgenic or edit one gene with an editor. Um, but there are situations where you have to edit multiple genes, and that's certainly the case for transplantation. And uh, a particular kind of transplantation is where you're altering the T cells so that they can work usually a little more transiently than you would in a, in a stable transplant, but, but long enough that they need to be uh, compatible. And, these, mm -hmm. and s since there's a there's a safety, a cost, and uh, just a scale uh, advantage to having a single kind of therapeutic. You know, you want to have as big a market as you can for a single therapeutic, so you, mm -hmm. you want to make it as universal as possible. The larger the market, then the, then the higher the denominator is for your fixed clinical uh, trial costs, and you, you can bring the price down. Anyway, um, so... Uh, to make them universal, you, you, uh, you would do things like, uh, and this is mostly for CAR-T therapy, so this is a uh, chimeric antigen receptor in T cells that will attack typically blood uh, cancers. They don't work so well yet in tumors, but, but we and others are working on um, ways to make them work in solid tumors, um, possibly via NK and macrophages, not just T cells. But in any case, back to the T cells, you want to make them, you want, you're bringing in an artificial T cell receptor. This is so-called chimeric receptor. So you want to get rid of the natural T cell receptors, which are different for all the different T cells. So you're doing this en masse in a big T cell population or potentially in a hematopoietic stem cell precursor. Anyway, you want to get rid of the naturally occurring uh, T cell receptors. So that's, that's one kind of knockout. You want to... Um, uh, change the MNHC from something that's easily rejected to something that's, that's tolerated. So you might change it from the classic class one and class two MHC to MHC uh, E, um, rather than A, B, C, D, R, D, Q, change it to E. And that's mm -hmm. something that's more like the, the um, fetal uh, MHC that's not rejected by them. In fact, many mothers will have fetal cells that in principle uh, is, should be rejected based on the father's MHD antigens, but they'll persist for decades in the mother's bloodstream. So, so we're trying to make these temporary these T cells temporarily cloaked, so they're mm. not immediately rejected. So, and then there's uh, there might be some editing to make the cells resistant to the chemotherapeutics that you use. Uh, mm. to, to, so you're using chemotherapeutics to kill off the B cells. Let's say the B cell leukemia. You don't want to also kill off your CAR T cells, so that, so that it gets to be a, a sizable number of genes, you know, two or more, two to five maybe, and that number could go up as we get more confident with the safety and efficacy of multiplex editing. Now the pigs are even higher level, rather than two to five, they're 42, um, but we can go even higher than that. Our, our record for multiplex editing so far is 22,000 edits in a single human uh, stem cell. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, and that was that. That was uh, to address the issue of uh, whether line elements, which are viral-like elements that hop around in your genome, whether those might be de deleterious during aging. Uh, we're, we're not done with that experiment yet, but we are. We have shown a very high uh, editing rate. Right. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support.
I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.